Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space and the first session of our new course on postcolonialism. Now, I have developed this course tentatively because quite a few of you had requested through the comments on the YouTube channel to develop something that is more formal and has kind of a progressive narrative or progressive methodology. And that's why I went and created this simple course. And my hope, of course, is that more and more, more of you will join this conversation and contribute to it because that's the only way we can really uh, learn from each other. So today I had uh, decided to uh, kind of begin with a definition of the field of post-colonial studies itself. And uh, the reason that is crucial, of course, for any field of study or any subject, you do want to kind of pinpoint, you know, what it is, how people try, try to define it. Now, you obviously know that I have immense, not immense, ample resources on my channel on post-colonial studies itself. And I do encourage you uh, to watch some of those videos to augment this. And then the hope is that after we have this conversation, then you'll go and read widely, right? Even if post-colonialism isn't your field of study, but if you're you know, struggling against oppression against patriarchy, against class biases, racial and ethnic biases, there is always something in post-colonial studies that can help you articulate your point better and be more convincing because that those are the issues that post-colonialism deals with. So before I go into uh, Robert Young's discussion of it, and the reason I've chosen Robert Young is because I think he, his explanation of the post-colonial in terms of his book is the most extensive. This is probably the best book on post-colonial studies uh, for many reasons, but the most important reason is that because he gives us a history of intellectual and material colonial struggles from all over the colonized world. But another important thing that he provides us, which other books on post-colonialism don't, is that he also connects a lot of post-colonial struggles to the Marxism of their time, to the Second International, First International. And that is usually missed in simply the culturalist explanation of post-colonial studies. So the essay I chose was written in 2009. It was published in volume 40 of Ariel, right? So and the reason I chose it is because it gives us not a precise definition, but a really, really nuanced definition of what to Robert Young is post-colonialism. And I think that's a good place to start. Um, now, before uh, I go into it, just uh, a quick reference to the course website. So as you already probably are aware, I now have created a course page on my website, postcolonial.net. The link to it is in the description of today's conversation, but it will be in the description of all the lectures that we deliver or the discussions that we have under this series. And if you look, look there, anytime you want to know what we are doing next week, the link to that would be here. That would be our weekly live stream link. Then as we increase the volume or uh, frequency of uh, our uh, weekly talks, whatever we do one week, that will keep getting listed under the live stream archive so you can actually access it date by date. And then below it are roughly at this point, these are our readings, right? And they are all available in PDF format. And then I'll keep adding more readings to it. And that's how you will access the readings and we'll be able to discuss them. Uh, my hope is that uh, by the time we reach a certain end, I mean, there it's not gonna end like 
here we have finished post-colonialism is but uh, by a certain time through these sessions, through watching other videos that are already there and by reading, you will develop a clear sense of not just what post-colonialism is, but how to do work as a post-colonial scholar. And that's my hope. Okay, so uh, I, I have Shamika here, uh, Nog here, Oroko, thank you all. Infinita, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's kind of encouraging to see that quite a few of you are here. So uh, I will go into how Robert Young uh, opens the conversation and then hope that you have questions that I can answer or we can talk about, right? So on the very first page, he uh, kind of gives us a precise stance. Right, he says um, that before we go into post-colonial studies, it is important to kind of discuss what post-colonial and post-coloniality is. Right, and he says people define and use these words in many different ways. Even what might seem to be the obvious core meaning of post-colonial, that is coming after the colonial, cannot be taken for granted. And I've discussed this before, that the post in the post-colonial doesn't necessarily mean that imperialism is over and that there was an end point somewhere in the 80s when Zimbabwe becomes independent, that, post -colonial, that colonialism ended, because we all know, especially those living in the global periphery, that the power of the metropolitan centers still exerts itself on the cultural systems, on economic systems and absolutely also on politics. So that means that that phase of colonialism, the actual occupation of these lands might have ended, but the material and ideological power still exists. And then we already know that there are so many kinds of internal colonialisms already existent, you know, Palestine, Kashmir, um, the territories of, of Rohingya Muslims, all of this. So, you know, if you go into the national conflicts themselves, the internal colonialisms also exist. But here is how he, if you look on the screen, what he says then is that I prefer to preserve the historical specificity of the term. And to think of the post-colonial as involving what we might simply refer to as the aftermath of the colonial, right? So that's the core assertion that he's making, that whatever calls itself self post-colonialism or post-colony or post-colonial in one way or the other is engaging with this experience of colonialism either during the contact phase or in describing the resistances or what colonialism leaves it as its legacy in the post colonies. So that's where he pinpoints it. The situation and problems that have followed decolonization, whether in the formerly colonized or colonized country are then encompassed in the term post-coloniality. So that's the distinction is that it's not just the contact phase of colonialism. Post-colonialism for Robert Young involves, okay, literatures, critical writing, political writings about the act of colonization itself as it was happening. What kind of resistances were offered? How those resistances were offered? How did different nations fight for their individual independence, what processes did they use? And then engaging with the legacies of colonialism, what kind of national and national cultures did colonialism leave? What kind of divisions, what kind of class systems? So that means both the contact phase, the liberation phase and the post colony phase after these nations become independent forms and can form part of the study of post-colonialism. Okay, let me see if there are any comments. Okay, welcome Kasim, when, welcome when, when, when Kata. And uh, thank you for joining me. That's really encouraging.
So I'll keep going. So by now, we know how exactly, or if not exactly, what does he cover? It has to be about the colonial experience, but it can be the colonial experience of all the different phases, right? Not necessarily only what comes after the colonialism is over, but what was happening at that point? How were the intellectuals and theorists and activists and freedom fighters fighting about it? And then, you know, how are people thinking life in the post colonies as they became independent nations right now. All of this is uh, part of post-colonialism and post-colonial studies. Yeah. Then he goes on to, uh, on the next page, and I'll keep reading a little bit and then talk about it. Uh, Post-colonialism concerns are centered on geographic zones of intensity that have remained largely invisible, but which prompt or involve questions of history, ethnicity, complex cultural identities, and questions of representations of refugees, immigration, and immigration of poverty and wealth but also importantly, the energy, vibrancy, and creative cultural dynamics that emerge in positive ways from such demanding circumstances. So that's another layer. Okay, we're gonna talk about the colonial experience and the resistances to that, but within that, we can also focus on histories that might have been silenced, stories that have not been told by the powerful metropolitan historians and writers, right? And so then telling those stories from Kenya, from Morocco, from elsewhere, what happened to people over there, either direct, under direct or indirect control of the colonizers, that becomes part of it too. The, the migrations of people, immigration and migration within nations, famines, right? Uh, and uh, the current refugee crisis, what is the cause behind them? Why are these wars being fought? Who is funding them? All of that then also becomes part of post-colonial studies because it's one main concern is to add the voices, the silenced histories and silenced voices against, juxtapose it against the mainstream knowledge, right? Mainstream history. And in that sense, it's uh, you, if you go and read Foucault's lecture on, on uh, I think it's hermeneutics of the subject, where he talks about the dominant knowledge, which in this sense would be the knowledge produced by the colonizers, and then hidden or bruised knowledge, knowledge that was there produced but has never been uh, juxtaposed against the dominant knowledge. So it's an act of retrieving those silenced knowledges. And then when you bring that to bear upon the mainstream knowledge, then it complicates the simplistic narrative that might have been told to us. Um, Can we say, and this is Aksa, can we say that it is the irony of post-colonialism that it is still tied to colonialism? Absolutely not. Uh, I, I agree uh, people, uh, especially in Pakistan are teaching a different kind of colonialism, which is kind of a naive nativism. And I disagree with that approach. It doesn't really matter what it is attached to, okay? What matters is what its practitioners, its scholars assert, right? Those who are opposed to you will always, you know, point out things that, that suit their purpose, right? We will read R.F. Derlich's essay next time. I, he's a friend of mine, a great scholar, uh, but the reason he opposes post-colonialism is because people like me came to the metropolitan, became professors and, started paddling our wares to a metropolitan audience, which is a really cynical view. What would you rather have in the world in metropolitan cultures? Would you rather have Victorian studies, romantic studies, early American studies, giving you the narratives which their scholars have thought are the ultimate historical narratives? Or would you have a couple of Edward Said's and Gayatri Spivak's and Masood Rajas, I'm not placing myself in that category, sorry. Uh, 
standing up and saying, uh, not really, or some Native American scholars saying, uh, no, you didn't come into an empty land. This was the League of Iroquois territory. Here is their history. Here are their monuments, right? What kind of a world would you have? Does it matter what we call it? Post-colonialism is an imperfect name, but it is a name that is now officially recognized as a field of study in English departments. What does that do? What it does is it makes it possible for curriculums to be developed, for courses to be offered, and then those courses complicate the mainstream narrative. And that's the important thing. I dis It's definitely not... Rest oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are going there. Uh, I mean, uh, one criticism of it, post-colonial studies has always been uh, that, oh, that means that the history before colonialism didn't exist. We need to start from our colonial experience only. But Young is very careful. What he's telling us is that, yes, it will tell the story of the colonizing act. But it will also, people have gone and retrieved histories before colonialism, right? They've gone, especially if they were orientalized or silenced. Right, People have gone and retrieved what their scholars and their poets were writing before colonialism. Colonialism is a reference because we are responding to it and because it was a powerful dominant discourse which materially captured most of the world. Right, And we have to account for what happened it's, and especially its narratives of having brought civilization to the world. So we will be responding to that, but now, Post-colonial studies does echo criticism. It does feminism. It does, uh, you know, criticism of political Islam. It does criticism of neoliberal globalization. All of these fields are not necessarily referring to the colonial experience itself, but they are still challenging the dominant hierarchies of the world. And the dominant hierarchies of the world are in the hands of about 10 or 12 industrialized nations, most of them from the North Atlantic region. And, and so that critique is also part of, you know, literary studies, part of post-colonial studies. Uh, okay, good. Uh, Rangnath, okay. Do we need to reassess the canonical post-colonial discourse because it doesn't talk about many discourses of knowledge, movement thinkers like Gandhi. Actually, uh, yes and no. I mean, if you uh, go, that's why I chose Robert Young. I mean, if you go over his chapter in India, right? Uh, it's an amazing discussion of not just Gandhi and what does Gandhi do, uh, but also Ram Mohan Roy, the Indian leftists, right? Muslim as well as Hindu and Sikh. Uh, so increasingly scholars are doing research on not just the traditional canonical texts, right? I mean, think of it, the established scholars. Where does Homi Baba go, right, to native India? Gayatri Spivak goes to the original texts, right, in Sanskrit, right? Uh, Edward Said goes to Palestine, to goes to the Arab world. So we already have these three main scholars established who are going through these three regions of the, of the world. Then if you go to the African scholars, like people like Chen Wei Zhu, people like Ngugi Chiango, come back to uh, the Indian American scholars, Chandra Mohanty, right, goes to Punjab. So what I would like to say is that that is the beauty of post-colonial studies, that there is no established canon. And since 80% of this globe was at one point colonized, right, so the voices come from different parts of the world. And that's another critique of post-colonial studies as a subfield which Young deals with. And this is a question that is not necessarily just an intellectual question. This question is usually posed to people who are studying post-colonial studies. Is one of my PhD students was asked, you know, why are there uh, novels from 40 countries on your list, reading list? What brings them together? 
And the question came from a scholar who is a single author expert. To that person, reading 40 novels from 40 different countries was, she couldn't figure out what brought them together. And Young answers that question, right? What he says is that even though colonial enterprises worked through different mechanisms, right? Italians, the Germans to French and English, but the end result was always kind of the same. And that was that a dominant European regime captured territory in Africa, in Asia, developed their own system of economics and politics, governed those places without representative democracies, right? And extracted resources so we can claim that even though the, the nuanced mechanisms of these systems might have been different, the experience could be particular to every colonized people, but the experience of domination was pretty same. Right. So hence, if we are to cobble together 40 novels from 40 post-colonial countries, what brings them together then is not just the experience of colonialism, but how did people resist it? What did they write to mobilize their own people? So it's never always the narrative of victimhood. It's always how did the Europeans come in? What kind of plunder did they commit? And then how did the native people respond to that, right? Because that is a huge account of post-colonial studies. Um, can we say that post-colonialism starts during? Absolutely, that's exactly what he's saying. Not just that it starts there, that it deals with not only the experience of colonialism and colonization, and what happens there, that's one historical retrieval. And what does it do? It complicates the simplistic narrative of the colonial history itself. But it can also go and retrieve certain things. Like if you want to go and uh, you know challenge Macaulay's assertion that the entire knowledge of India could be placed on two shelves, you will go back, back and say, here, OK, let, let me show you what our scholars have done just, just in Hinduism, just, just the, the, the study of the Vedas. Here are thousands upon thousands of texts that they have written, works of scholarship. Here are thousands and thousands of texts on Buddhism or on Islam, right? So what you're then suggesting is you're going back into pre-colonial history and saying we had a culture, we had a history of learning as well. And that is your, you are juxtaposing that retrieval against an assertion made by the colonizers. And then beyond that, what happens during the colonial phase? I mean, if you read, uh, I highly recommend you get, uh, because what he does is he, he traces the resistance movements all over pretty much starting with Latin America and then India, Africa. And how did these leader, these movements articulate themselves? How did they challenge? So that's another phase. And then in the post colonies, the critiques of the nation itself, where it is headed, what it's doing, right? Uh, um, the greatest example of it, of course, on a scholarly scale is the subaltern studies project, you, Ranajit Guha and others, right? These are the people who can go back and say, you know what, the Indian national narrative is kind of the narrative of the elite, right? Now let us go and research and find out the subaltern histories, the silenced histories. So as a result, you see those 10 volumes sitting on my desk. Uh, thankfully, Pakistani scholars are still too busy uh, you know, writing poems of love for the nation, they haven't had time to do that. And if you do it, it's a kind of a perilous journey because you're immediately, by a lot of people, considered a traitor to the national cause, which is like so silly, but also so sad. But a lot of other scholars, you know, like in Africa, if you go read Chen Wei Zhu, uh, you know, there is a critique of post colonial nation state, how does the elite still remain in sync with the colonial powers? If you read uh, Ngugi Tiango, 
his scholarly work, but also his novels, Devil on the Cross, is about the failure of imagination in the post-colony. So yeah, you can you can add a temporality to it where it starts, but make it nuanced because the biggest critique would would be well that if you are calling yourself post-colonialist, that means that the history of post colonies only exist with reference to colonization. And you can always come back and say, no, that's not. The reason we are studying this is because it was 200 years of a foreign rule at a very dynamic time in human history when all the other countries were developing industrialization, capital, and this experience stymied if there is a natural progression of history of these countries. I always use this example from my, uh, for my undergraduate classes, uh, is that, okay, if people tell you, well, you know, colonialism was good for India because it built railways and introduced an educational system, I always give them like a very simple litmus test, right? And that is, Okay, in 1947, when the British leave India, they have held India for over 250 years, I think. Just take up the demographics and infrastructural aspects of New Delhi, which was the capital of India, still is, I think, right? And compare it with London, right? Now, infrastructurally, is Delhi equally as developed as London was? Right? Because if the British treated India as an equal part of the British Commonwealth, then infrastructurally they should have developed India at the same scale as they developed the mother country. And that is absolutely not the case. Right, But then also go into what Achille Mamembe calls the habits of democracy, right, which is hugely crucial in post-colonial studies, is when the colonizers leave, right, do they leave democratic systems, right? Have people internalized that they live in a democracy? Most of the times what they leave behind is the same infrastructure of non-representative power, right? So my experience is only of India and Pakistan, right? What did they leave us? Deputy commissioners, right? Powerful police, right? No jury uh, uh, decisions by the court, right? While they've always had a jury of the peers decides a case, right? No, in the colonies, a judge can decide a single case. Sometimes it's not even a panel of judges. Then our civil servants whose job it is to serve us are not responsible to the people and they still consider themselves as masters of the people. These are the systems that were in place that, that the post colonies inherit. What ends up happening is that people have not had a hundred years experience of living in a democracy. They are still learning what their rights are. They are still learning that they are the ones who own the government and not the people in power. All of these ills, the colonies inherit, and part of it is because the time was stopped and the progression of political thought and practice was stopped under colonialism. And that's also what Young would say is part of post-colonial studies, right? I'll come back to your questions in a minute, but I want to go to his next point. What he says on page 15 then is post-colonialism therefore begins from its own counter knowledges and from the diversity of its cultural experiences and starts from the premise that those in the West, particularly both within and outside the academy should relinquish their monopoly on knowledge and take other knowledges, other perspectives as seriously as those of the West. Okay, so that is the challenge to normalize knowledges. Think of it this way, those of you who are coming from the colonies, what is our biggest problem? Now I know PhD students from Pakistan who are told that they cannot pick up an Urdu book, translate it themselves and put it in their dissertation. Why? Because you are not allowed to say in 
MLA tells you if it's your own translation, you can just add my translation. I did that in my dissertation in America. Why would your professors not let you do that? Because they still have that internalized colonial mindset where basically someone else superior to you should have translated a work for it to be credible, right? Now that is that kind of colonial mindset. Beyond that, people still teach the Western canon Right. And being a good English major is that I can quote my Iliad well and I can quote Shakespeare well. Right. That's what studying English means. Right. There is nothing wrong with that, but assigning it that kind of value. Beyond that, even just studying the text, I mean, that the value, how we evaluate Hindi medium schools, Urdu medium schools and English medium private schools. Right. And it's actual material value in the world, in the workplace, right? All of this is part of our colonial legacy here. So what is the job of a post-colonialist then, right? Someone gives me the story, you know, a, a novel, right? A Thousand Splendid Sons or, you know, The Kite Runner, right? And it's an amazing story. It's a moving story, all that. But then you basically point out, uh, okay, yeah, uh, Taliban are bad, absolutely, but no one is telling you who created the Taliban, right? Whose interests were they safeguarding until they started transgressing, right? And beyond that, how many people died when America invaded Afghanistan? These are ours. This is our job then to complicate the simplistic narrative that underwrites the imperial power. Right. So that's what he calls counter knowledge. Right. Or if you go to any other history, right, any claims to civilized behavior upon which the edifice of colonialism was built and you go and retrieve histories and you go, no, no. I mean, this is what you also did. This is what you're already doing. So what it does is it, it destabilizes a narrative of power. Right. And that's the role that postcolonial scholars here and elsewhere can play. You can further hone it down to challenging the mainstream assumptions of the nation state itself. Right. Uh, if, if the nation state is offering itself as I am this and I am that. Right. You can basically as a scholar chip away at that by pointing out the inconsistencies. And that would be the counter knowledge brought to bear upon a mainstream narrative, a narrative of, of hegemonic narrative or narrative of dominance. And that's also what post-colonialism does. Um, and then he goes on to discuss, you know, a body of writing, right? Uh, which is theoretical, which is political. And now it has a huge body of writing, but one important part of being a post-colonial scholar is that you're not just an erudite scholar. Most post-colonial scholars are also committed activists, right? If they are not out in the streets sloganeering, they at least are writing in sympathy or in solidarity with someone who's downtrodden, someone who's ostracized. So that means that they can build alliances, right? Over here, you know, we have alliances with African American studies scholars. We have alliances with Latino and Latina studies scholars. We have alliances with gay and lesbian scholars, right? Anyone who's either ostracized or is in a situation where a dominant group wants to dictate what is right and wrong, post colonialism then can be a field of study that works in solidarity with others against the dominant narrative. But what kind of a, so that is what he calls the social activism. The work of post-colonial will, uh, the philosophical and theore the theoretical analysis of the post-colonial is always linked to social activism, right? And beyond the political activism and social activism, the work of challenging at any stage any narrative that offers itself as natural, that offers itself, uh, you know, as the only true narrative, 
that becomes the part of the post-colonial. So if you look at what's happening right now, the way capitalism and neoliberalism offers itself as natural, right? It has been naturalized through global policies and everything else. So the work of post-colonial then we would be to point out, okay, here are the ramifications of this economic system. This is what privatization is doing in Kenya. This is what privatization is doing in Madras. This is what privatization is doing, you know, in Pakistan, right? Pointing those things out then also become part of post-colonial studies, right? So the sense then we get is that it's not a static field of study. Though it deals with the experience of colonialism, that is not its beginning and end point. It goes beyond that and then becomes a, a field of study that questions power and dominance. Power as a global power, but also power within the post-colonial nation states themselves, the gender hierarchies, sexism, right? Any kind of oppression that tells you that a certain group of people are not equally as human as the dominant group then becomes challenging that then becomes the subject of post-colonial studies, right? Um, let me see. Okay, uh, Akib, can we say that post-colonialism, uh, okay, uh, I, I think I already answered that question. So we can take post-colonialism as revisionist myth-making, not necessarily myth-making, yeah, myth-making in that technical term, uh, but I would rather say that a revisionist myth-busting, right? You don't go and create a nativist myth. That would destroy the whole purpose of the project. Uh, you go and take whatever mythologies are at work from the dominant group, and then you offer them whatever was silenced in order to create that mythology. You know, how does knowledge become dominant, right? You know, any knowledge by excluding things that challenge it, right? How do we do that? We do it through textbooks. We do it through official histories, official media, right? And that's how one narrative, one mythology becomes the ultimate mythology, right? national or regional or whatever. So our job then is to go and point out, this is what was silenced to create this mythology, right? And you can do that by historical retrieval, by collecting data, by doing interviews, but as long as you're picking up on that normalized mythology, Right? The knowledge that offers itself as ultimate and all enlightening, after all, be has become so through an act of power, right? The, through the power to disseminate itself, right? So um, let me give you like an example for my Pakistani scholar friends. I'm ra now reading a, for my book on Mr. Jinnah, right? And when you read the book, right? Uh, I'm reading uh, Aisha Jalal's book on it, right? One of the groundbreaking researches on uh, All India Muslim League. Now, if you if you go and read uh, any Pakistan studies textbook, you get this coherent narrative, right? Pakistan, All India Muslim League was a one united front, and they, with the help of Qaeda Azam, struggled against Gandhi and against all the other Hindus and everyone else to make Pakistan. That's a beautiful narrative, right? It's a national narrative, but it's an absolutely flawed and absurd narrative, right? Muslim League was never a united political party. We know that. Our own historian actually has done research on it. Right? We know that until the last moment, all these unionists in Punjab, the politicians in Bengal were constantly not ready to admit to Jinnah's strategy. Right? And they were constantly challenging him. Same in Sindh. Right? Now, all of that knowledge is there, but it has been suppressed because it is never taught. It is never written about. So what you get is a mythologized idea of the Pakistan movement. Right? What is wrong with that? People would say, well, we need narratives like that to build a nation. I was like, yeah, fine, you do. But if you build a nation on flawed narratives, 
on narratives that must exclude, must keep certain knowledge out, then you're creating a really paranoid identity. Because then what you are is, oh, don't tell children about this. Don't let them read this. Then you, then for, for until the end of time, all your energies are in maintaining a flimsy narrative that you have created out of exclusions. That's how all religions are, right? That's how all deeply fundamentalist political ideologies are because they stabilize themselves through acts of exclusion. And then the only way they can maintain themselves is by excluding any dangerous knowledge that might through sanction, through material punishments, right? Through fear of death and all. And that's not really a healthy way of living a life. But that's how official narratives maintain themselves, right? And the role of the intellectual then is to constantly unravel them, right? Challenge them, right? Point out that, you know, this is downright false, but here is something else that people have said. Another simple example would be, for example, um, in 1858, after the first rebellion fails in India, Queen Victoria decides that she is going to take a direct role in India. So she dismisses the administration of East India Company and becomes the Queen Empress of India, right? And that's where she issues a decree, a proclamation, taking India as her own um, uh, territory as the queen, right? And, uh, you know, forgiving or whatever. Now, when she issues that proclamation, it's a royal proclamation for India, right? But at that time, in the, in the province of Avad, Lucknow, there was also a local queen, right? Hazrat Mahal, right? Who, along with his Muslim and Hindu rajas, had fought the British, right? And escapes to Nepal not Nepal, uh, Myanmar. She also issues a proclamation in which she says, what right do you have to proclaim India as yours? Right? Historically, we have never talked about that proclamation because it was hidden, it was in Farsi, no one read about it. But then about 20, 25 years ago, someone went and retrieved it right? and juxtaposed it with Victoria's voice. right? Now, that is retrieval. It doesn't change history, but it tells us, you know, we did this too, right? Um, another wonderful uh, example from the same period is that when, when her forces have fallen, right, and she's preparing her retreat because she was given the option to sign a deal with the British and stay as a nominal ruler with her husband or take exile. So she chooses to take exile. But when she does so, one of her most powerful nobles was Raja Man Singh, right? Who had brought a lot of forces to fight. So the British, you know, they go and invest Man Singh's fortress and they say, you know, you got nothing to lose. Sign your allegiance with us and you can keep your lands and your territory and your power. But you know what Raja Man Singh tells them? He is like, these lands? And everything else, my jagir, was given to me by my queen. You can take it. But this name and the honor attached to it belongs to my queen. And Raja Man Singh then decides to take exile with his Muslim queen. Now, these are the narratives where we can tell our children, right, that the Muslims and Hindus of India didn't always have irreconcilable differences, that they died together for freedom right? And that they lived in the same communities. Yeah, maybe they didn't visit each other too often or didn't intermarry, but they lived peacefully, respected each other's religion, right? What can we build on that then, right? If that kind of knowledge existed in both these belligerent nations is retrieving those histories will then enable us to create a future in which we don't look at each other as enemies, in which we Look at each other as people who had a shared history of struggle against our oppressors, right? And that is post-colonial studies, if done daringly and with love, right? Uh, 
Okay, let me see other. But in the kite runner is the exaggerate. It's aimed to make them happy and get fame. I don't buy into that. I mean, I think the author has a right to represent any way he or she wants a story. The kite runner was written for a popular audience. There is a lot of work on it. There was a whole issue of one of the journals on it. I disagreed with it on one ground, and that is that the story was too simplistic, right? And uh, they, and the larger ground is not given as to how Afghanistan becomes the Afghanistan of the Taliban, right? Who created Taliban, right? Um, but overall, the novel also had a lot of impact because remember, while we talk about history and truth, empathy is also connected to whether or not we can feel something for the characters in a story, and we absolutely feel something for the characters in a story. Uh, so this whole idea, and it comes a lot in Pakistan, is that the diasporic authors, I'm a critic of diasporic authors, because I believe that they do pander sometimes. But when you read a piece of literature like that, you have to have a more nuanced opinion about it. Um, Yes, and Aisha Jalal's work is not your run-of-the-mill scholarly work. It's a scholarly work of extreme diligence and 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 courage. Yeah. Yes, how India's post-colonial discourse would be different? Well, I mean, uh, think of it how it would be different because both nations think of each other as belligerent nations, right? Not naturally, but subjectively, that's the kind of politics that... So you will see, depending on whose point of view you are reading. Now, if you look at the, all the major English scholars, right? Um, uh, Indian scholars, you know, Partha Chatterjee and others, they don't really care who was a Muslim and who was a Hindu. I mean, one of the most famous essays of Partha Chatterjee is a... Uh, 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 challenge to the story of uh, uh, of the Nawab's cave, the dungeon in which he is supposed to have kept 200 British people. And Partha Chatterjee goes and says, I mean, this is impossible physically, but also historically. And that's about Nawab Siraj Dola, right? I think it's in the political arena that increasingly religion plays a role and the narratives of exclusivity play a role. Right, and the, both nations are guilty of that. Right, um, so uh, right now, if you look at Indian politics, a certain kind of religious identity is being privileged over all the others. My personal reading of India has always been that what made India successful. I mean, it it has its problems: Kashmir and poverty and the Adivasis and the problem of the Dalit population and their rights, but. What made India somewhat of a post-colonial success was that they were able to cobble together a constitution that accounted for the diversity of India, right? And remember, who wrote the constitution, right? You know, uh, Ambedkar, right? Uh, B.R. Ambedkar wrote the constitution, who himself was a Dalit leader and then eventually becomes Buddhist, right? Uh, so anytime the Indian politicians erode the spirit of that constitution, what they are then doing is creating a majoritarian state. And majoritarian state also in a way where the majority has a very strong military wing, which enforces illegally the mandates of the majority. And that is the ultimate path to India's destruction. Because what sustained India and made it into the powerhouse of the modern world wasn't one religion, wasn't one philosophy, but a complex constitution which enabled it to weld, not weld together, but to blend so many different you know, branches of life, despite its problems. Those problems are always there. So the role of the scholar is to point out those problems so that the nation keeps getting better, right? But that's what I see. Uh, so their discourse is probably more expensive Right, because in India, you don't just do scholarship of India. There, there are regional scholars in Tamil, like right, Malayalam, in in the north, and pretty much 
you know, they deal with local issues. You know, if you look at the 10 volumes of Subaltern Studies Project, they all come from so many different parts of India, right? So their post-colonialism would be um, also be dealing with issues of caste, right? That's a huge issue, right? And so I would say that most Indian scholars who are in diaspora are very well established. And they don't just deal with issues of India, they deal with issues of globalization, issues of feminism, issues of gender. And they also usually dare to think beyond their national identity. I'm not saying Pakistanis don't do that or Bangladeshis don't do that, but they simply don't have the numbers, right? of people who are doing that. Another thing about India is that, you know, it's a democracy, almost being destroyed by the present government, but it is a democracy. People, there is a free press, right? Okay, it must be biased, it must be this or that, depending on their politics, but Arundhati Roy, whose work I love, can go to Pakistan and give a speech which is critical of India itself, not just the Indian government, but India as it exists because of its problem of population and caste and whatever, and come back to her own country, right? Other than the extreme right-wing people who hate her anyway, no one can tell her, hey, you know, you're a traitor and you can't enter India anymore. But the same Arundhati Rai, when she published her paper, did have to go to court on an obscenity charge, right? Because there was a mentioning of sex in her novel. So, I mean, these are the contradictions of post-colonial nations, but there is no comparative thing like that in Pakistan or even in Bangladesh. And part of the reason is that both those countries have not had 73 years of uninterrupted democracy. Because what democracy does is it creates the subjectivities of a democratic nation. It, it rethinks the institutions, right? Makes people a part of the process of nationalism. Now, all of these topics are also part of post-colonial studies, right? Angu Gichango does that for Kenya a critique of his own nation. And if you read the opening passages of Devil on the Cross, what he starts with is, what do you want me to do if I see holes in my front yard, right? And know that my children would fall in it, right? Do I cover them up with leaves? Or do I point out there are holes in my front yard? Beware, right? Let's fill them up, right? But that's his argument because he knows that the novel that he's writing is going to critique the nation at his, as it has emerged post-independence. Does the post-colonial, I think the historiography, the literature, it plays a role because what does literature do? It's not always totally reflective, right? But it's grounded in the reality, right? wherever it is being produced. It would tell us a story in human terms of how people live their lives, right? But also would tell us the inequalities that exist, right? Or the injustices that exist. Let's see, for example, um, you know, uh, Roy's novel, God of Small Things, right? It is one of the most beautiful novels you will ever read, right? It's a heartbreaking novel. Right. And it's set in a state, you know, which has which is one of the finest examples of development in India. Right. The state in 1954, I think they destroyed, they dis took away bigger land holdings, distributed them amongst the peasants with an education rate of, I think, 99 percent. Right. But when she tells the story, what is she doing on a global, global scale? When you hear of India in America or Canada, what comes to your mind? New Delhi, right? Maybe Kolkata, right? No one thinks of, you know, Kerala in the South, right? Or the culture of Kerala, right? So first of all, that work introduces the setting to a global audience and to a national audience. 
It's not like people living in North of America are very familiar with the languages and cultures of the North of India. I mean, there is a huge linguistic divide. Another thing that novel then does is within the story, it tells a human story of two kids and their mother and story of her, their mother's love, right? Crossing the caste barrier with Veluta. So it then highlights that even in the Naxalite, the Marxist Kerala, the caste is still a barrier that the Marxists even cannot break, right? So then it highlights that problem. It also highlights the problem uh, of rules of love. How does law work? How What happens to a woman who's single and has two children, even though she has powerful parents? All of these issues then tell the story of two characters and their mother, right? And her lover. But they also then tell the story of what still needs to be done in the process of nation making. What is it that we need to think about and care about? And in that sense, then works of fiction, works of criticism constantly enable the post-colonial nation state to rethink itself, right? Similarly, if you are not a literary critic or not a writer, if you are an economist, right? Your job is, you know, to go and point out as an economist, what you are doing right now is not in the interest of our people, right? What, what you are doing is implementing the mandates of, you know, the World Trade Organization. It's not in the interest of our people to do that. So that is also post-colonial work, like people like Samir Amin and others, right, who, who go and do this progressive economic theory, right? Now, if these people didn't exist, what would our leaders have to rely on? The knowledge that is coming from the West. This is how the economy must work. This is how politics must work. So the significance of post-colonial work is that in all fields, then it gives us counter knowledge, counter histories, counter ways of thinking the lives of our own people. But it does that always in solidarity with those who are outside the mainstream power structures, right? Because that is kind of one of the necessary preconditions of post-colonialism, that it must represent the silenced narratives. It must work in solidarity with those who are oppressed, right? And it must never sell itself uncritically to dominant powers. Now, can we do that? No, I mean, you know, you go and work for a university. Um, do you become part of the university policy? Maybe or maybe not. Because you you always if, if your discipline, if your field of study consistently tells you to critique power, you know, you'll do that at the cost of your work, right? Because honestly, you won't be able to just buy into one politics or one power or one political party and try to develop your career through that. Right? Yes, I mean, we always, we always prefer, I mean, we come to history not from a vacant place, right? We come to history from our own ideological position. The question for the post-colonial is, which position will you take? Would you be a foundational intellectual and perpetuate the national or global narrative that is already in place, overwriting all the other narratives? Or would you be an organic intellectual and pick up a constituency, someone outside of the mainstream power of history, right? So if you are a feminist working for women in Punjab, or KPK, then you're making a choice. You are saying, I will work in solidarity with these people and their history, and that's the difference. If you're perpetuating the mainstream narrative of power, then you're not necessarily being a post-colonialist. So post-colonialist philosophically, intellectually, and pol politically must be connected with directly or in solidarity with the constituencies that are silenced, that are oppressed, right? And within that, there is no non-ideological 
approach to history or anything else. But your politics, your ideology would be tilted towards those who need, with whom you need to work in solidarity to get their rights. And that is why I like this saying in this essay. And this is towards the end where he says, the work of the post-colonial will only end when there are no unjust and unaccountable hierarchies of power in the world. When there are no forms of exclusion, no inside to which others are outsiders. What that also teaches us, you know, if you look at it carefully, is that the work of the post-colonial cannot be to be a foundational intellectual. It cannot be working for power and perpetuating its narratives. It must always be oppositional to dominant discourses, especially discourses that overpower others and try to dictate the way of life, right? And you can work from within a discourse. You know, uh, if you want to challenge a religious discourse, the best way of doing it is to go read those texts and point to the people throwing the book at you that here, read this carefully. It, you know, defies the logic of what you are saying. Even if you are challenging someone's assumptions from a religious point of view, political point of view, you have to learn that. You can't critique anything without knowing how it works, right? Um, but in solidarity with whosoever is an oppressed constituency would be part of a precondition, right? Good, Rosario, but isn't the nation itself an age of sort? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, the thing about nationalism, Fanon has a beautiful chapter on it in The Wretched of the Earth. Uh, because Fanon's idea was that we must first develop national consciousness because he felt it necessary to have a national consciousness to fight against colonizers. Right, because you have to mobilize a national movement against that. But beyond that, obviously, nation state, especially with its tools of oppression, becomes an institution of oppression. I mean, if you look at South America, I mean, uh, um, if you look at the liberation movement, it wasn't one country, right? It included a conglomeration of countries that fought against the Spaniards, right? So eventually, absolutely, to work towards a world in which there are no hard barriers between nations, right? But with a certain degree of subtlety, because that is what also neoliberalism wants. No barriers, but only no barriers to trade, right? Or movement of commodities. Now, what we would ask them then is, okay, if the commodities can move freely, right? And if capital can move freely, then the third element of the productive process is labor, right? So why can't labor move freely? If that can move freely, labor, then we have a global free economy. But absolutely, nation state in most of the cases in itself is becomes an oppressive institution. Right? And challenging its assumptions are absolutely necessary for post-colonial intellectuals. And they do that through their activism as well as through their writing. Let me go to Chandra Shekhar. Is there any possibility that three years, 300 years hence history will be able to, more, to be more generous towards colonialism when viewing it from outside the perspective of, uh, I don't know. I mean, there are still people who are, you know, uh, apologists for it. Uh, and what is history after all, right? History is textual. People record it. Uh, I don't think like people would say that it was absolutely a great thing, but people still already point out, even Gayatri Spivak would tell you, and, and she says so that, yeah, that was an act of epistemic and material violence, right? But it did create certain things that we can mobilize. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it was good. But in her book, uh, 
other Asias where she has the book chapter called uh, Foucault versus Najibullah, right? She talks about this, that, that, that this experience of coloniality enables the development of a different kind of politics. A politics that takes ideas from the West but rearticulates it. So, in that sense, yes, it was a terrible thing, but yeah, it did introduce certain good things, maybe different ways of looking at knowledges, different organization. The only challenge that we can pose then is to say, okay, all right, this system came from here, but can we make it our own? How can we articulate it differently where it is more representative and not just a true replica of what was brought or what is being mandated? I mean, think of the global economies right now, national economies or whatever, right? How are they being uh, crafted? You know, pretty much all developing nations owe money to IMF, right? What is IMF's logic? That it issues short-term loans and it must guarantee those loans because it owes that money to its shareholders, which are the most powerful nations on the planet. So what right does it give IMF then? IMF can actually come and sit with your prime minister and their cabinet and literally tell them, this is what we want you to do. Okay, that's their power. Because they know if they withhold the next installment of the loan or if they just go and say you have defaulted, your economy will crash, right? That's their power. So do we just buy into that system and say, you know, that's good or that's bad? Or do we come together as developing nations, right, and say, we're going to fight this. So what is the fight then? Forgive the debts, right? Forgive this so that we can start anew. Right? I don't know where the question was. Uh, so maybe that's where you know we can work as post-colonialists, but the post-colonial nation states themselves then can figure out how to do things that are in the best interest of their own people, right? And then the scholars and intellectuals within the nation constantly point to them that what you're doing is oppressing women, what you're doing is oppressing minorities, and that constant critique ought to be there. Now, if you take out that critique of the nation itself, silence the, the press, silence the intellectuals, label them traitors and all, you will then create a nation in which a few dominant constituencies get to dictate what truth is, right? And then that becomes the truth, but you also develop a nation of intolerances nations of hate for each other and others. You can never really create a loving, caring nation simply by one narrative. I mean, that's, it has never happened in history, right? Uh, but people do use examples from his. Oh, which novel? Uh, so it is Ngugi Chango. The novel is called uh, Devil on the Cross. It's a beautiful novel. You should read it. And then, you know, uh, who was here from Rosario? I mean, if you really want to read how someone beautifully renders how history is retold and fiction is made real, it's that scene from Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, right? That whole section where the train massacre happens. So he first tells you how many bodies were there, how many people were killed, right? And then through rumor and through stories, the entire massacre is made to, to, to be forgotten, is made into something that never happened. And that is the power of narratives, right? And, and I always use that example in my classes. I have read some of it. At this point, I don't know it good enough to have an opinion. I always am kind of skeptical of people who have these opinions about post-colonialism is dead. And because the thing is, uh, anyone who claims to be post-colonial to be not effective enough, and we will read some of them next week, right? Uh, 
they always make post-colonialism into something that they want to dismantle. And my whole idea is that um, as a term concept and as a field of study, even Young is telling us that it's not so easy to pinpoint because it is covering its flank and it constantly grows. I mean, I, I think of my own example. I studied with Robin Goodman, right? Now she's a scholar of political feminism, right? From her, I studied with her, what did I end up doing? One book on Pakistan, right? Another book on conservatism in United States, another book on political Islam and rise of ISIS, right? So combining my own knowledge of these cultures, but developing it in, into challenges to different power structures here and there. So there is no single way of re representing post-colonial studies other than what Young is telling us that it must focus on the rights of the oppressed, the rights of those who are outside the dominant structure, right? And it must retrieve and talk about the silenced histories, but it must do so without being nativist, without being, um, you know, oh, we are going to take out all Western knowledge and create this pure form of knowledge because that is, you know, a kind of terrible nativism. Um, I always give this example when I talk about Taliban or any other fundamentalist groups, because that the only problem they have is with liberating thought coming from outside. So uh, if they tell you the West is terrible, right, and anything associated with West is terrible, that's usually with the liberating ideologies of the West. Otherwise, they use the same guns made by the Westerns. They, they love the trucks and, you know, all the mediums of destructions made by the West. It's only the ideas that they are threatened with, with right? So there are these ironies everywhere. But post-colonial studies, in my sense, you can make it into whatever you want as long as you're dealing with some issues that impact people's lives economically, environmentally, in terms of their rights, in terms of their position within the social body. And as long as it is connected to a politics of liberation, right? Uh, OK, yes. Decolonization, absolutely. And decolonial studies coming from Walter Minvolo is also uh, a really great field. I don't see it as separate from post-colonial studies, but a lot of people are in uh, are focusing on decolonial studies. And the idea there is to even dismantle the way of thinking and decentralize it and make it into a way of thinking that comes from outside of Europe and West. And I think it's amazing. Um, but even there, I would not want to become a nativist, right? I don't believe that the dharma knowledge or the knowledge of Islam can itself in the 21st century solve our problems. No, I think it's always better to have hybrid knowledges, right? And not just rely on purist narratives. Um, but yes, it's absolutely a very good field. Yes, life and death, I loved it. I've shown it in my classes. Um, I highly uh, recommend that video to anyone. I don't know if it's available uh, freely or not, but my library has it. I had asked them to purchase it. And I always show it in my undergraduate classes. These, there are some movies I show them. I show them uh, The Battle of Algiers, right? When I, when I teach Fanon and Life and Death, when I teach about you know global globalization and neoliberalism. And Stephanie White, I think, was the producer of it. I highly recommend it as a, as a video aid. Uh, and the movie on Fanon, that's also a beautiful movie. Yes, it's... So Walter Minwolo, he has quite a few books, but his most prominent one is called uh, The Darker Side of what is it? The Darker Side of Renaissance, I think. That's one of his most prominent books. 
Okay, so this is good. Let me let you know that what we'll be doing next. Now, uh, remember to go to the website, but next Saturday, we will read part of the early debates. We will read uh, RF Dirlik's essay and talk about it. And it is a really interesting critique of post-colonial studies just as it was emerging. And that would then give us an idea of how do people critique post-colonialism and from which perspective. And so as, as practitioners of post-colonial studies, you know, you become aware of, you know, where are the critiques coming from? Part of it is to then remodulate what we do and rethink our practices. And so constantly then becoming a sort of a practitioner of a field of study who is aware of the challenges being posed from different circles. That's why I'm going to the early debates first. And then I'll find more texts like from Fanon and from others, and we can read those and discuss them. So that's all. Um, I think I'm going to call it a day now. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I hope you all keep joining us every Saturday. And you can always send me questions. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, and, you know, thank you all so much. And that's where I'll leave you. Thank you. Peace and love. And as always, this will be available as an edited version. And so you can always go back to this first lesson and uh, revise it. Thank you so much. And welcome those of you who joined us for the first time. And I will see you all next week.